Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Gene Signorini, and I'm excited for today's episode. Today's guest has a true passion for retail and has been published in several articles about how retailers can transform their business with technology. She currently serves as Vice President Sales Enablement at Main Street, Inc. Please welcome to the show, Debbie Samerta. Debbie, really glad to have you on the program today. Thank you, Jean. I'm really glad to be here. Certainly appreciate the opportunity. And I have to tell you how much I love this podcast. Yeah, and we appreciate you listening to it. I know we chatted about that previously. Yeah. Uh, and so we're, we're glad to have you, but we're also glad to have you because we know how passionate you are, not only about retail, but about this topic in general. As a um, regular listener to the program, I'm sure you know we love to kick off each episode with kind of the big question, which is, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the deskless workforce today? I think that's such a great question. And in the case of retail, you have um, employees that are working at store level that chances are probably making a minimum wage. They've been exposed to you know, a very difficult environment over the last two years. Um, they have shoppers that are just as anxious as they are. So it's been a very difficult time. On the retailer side of things, they're trying to do more with less. So, you know, they are, they maybe have less staff. Maybe there are people who are choosing not to work in retail, or there could even be some, you know, team members that are, that are sick with COVID that are out for a little while, but it still puts a lot of stress on that, that store level frontline worker. And, you know, it's not just, for example, in grocery, filling the shelves or being a cashier. It's, you know, the employee is now being asked or the frontline worker is being asked to, you know, start filling our curbside orders. That's a big area of growth for, for a retail business, especially a grocery business. The margin for error in that is very, very small. And you need to equip those frontline workers with the right technology and the right training. And so I think those are some of the big challenges that the frontline workers are seeing in retail. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a common theme we've heard. Obviously, everybody is under increased stress and anxiety um, over the events of the last couple of years. I don't think there's anybody who's been immune to that. But I think you hit on something, which is retail may be facing the biggest brunt of all. I mean, those retail employees, you know, when we talk about frontline workers, they're they're literally exposed to that that every day. And, and yes. I imagine the stress is even greater on them than, than most frontline workers. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that's something that I've been really passionate about. And, and since the pandemic started, you know, there has been so much recognition of frontline workers, especially in healthcare. And what they're going through is, is heartbreaking. But a retail frontline worker is, is very exposed as well, and sometimes is like an unsung hero of what's going on these days. Um, a healthcare worker, chances are, will make much more in terms of compensation, will be in a somewhat controlled and protected environment. In the case of retail, it can be like the Wild West. Those doors are open to anybody. And you do truly get to see a different mix of people shopping in those stores. And so you've got these frontline retail workers that are, you know, showing up every day doing their best and, you know, not making a lot of money. You know, unfortunately, the retail kind of average wage is maybe minimum wage or slightly higher. The retailers have tried to recruit by giving signing bonuses, um, maybe higher wages, but it's still not the same type of compensation. So I think a lot of retail employees also are looking at, you know, doing a level set. Is it worth it to be on the front line in retail? Am I going to take advantage of maybe some government programs, get some training, maybe try something different? So retail isn't for the timid. Yeah, well, I imagine they're also bearing the brunt 
of a lot of frustrations of customers, like you said, mm -hmm. getting people coming in those stores. Um, and, and that's got to be very difficult as well. It certainly is. Um, I work in a grocery store on Sundays, and that's kind of my, my hobby. Um, but I've been a frontline grocery worker um, for over two years. And, and in Texas, where it's somewhat of a, a state that really likes to not regulate very much. And so things have been, things can be somewhat combative at the store. I don't think people are doing it intentionally. I think it's really just the anxiety that everybody has or the fatigue that everybody has. Cause we're almost two years into this and, you know, it's like almost like enough is enough. So it's been a difficult time and hopefully we'll be coming out of it very soon. Yeah. And we definitely have to talk about your quote unquote hobby, which is <laughs> <laughs> an unusual one, I must say. Um, it is. What I'd really like to start with, though, I'm sure that folks on the who are listening who aren't very familiar with Main Street Inc. and and I'd love to talk a little bit about you to talk a little bit about the company and your role in the organization. I know um, Main Street has a, a very strong focus on retail. Absolutely. Um, so talk a little bit about what Main Street does um, and kind of why it exists, so to speak. What what's its 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 purpose? Uh, to help retailers. That's great. Um, retail, or sorry, Main Street is made up of people like me. So on our leadership team, we have people who have been in the retail industry as long as I have, which is 20 years or more on the technology side of things. So we've seen so much of what works and what doesn't work in a retail store. We've seen different fads, different trends. Our focus is primarily on the hardware investment that a retail makes on the technology that they use within the four walls of their store. So it could be their point of sale, could be mobility, networks, back of house, self-service equipment. Um, and I think one of the benefits of working with Main Street is that our primary focus is on the retailer themselves and on the investment that they've made in those systems. So we know that, you know, if you were to look at a grocery store and say they purchased, you know, X number of scan guns per store. Well, you amplify that investment across hundreds or thousands of stores, it's significant. And so we recognize that and we try and help the retailer get the most payback that they can from that investment. And so what that means is we will not end of life a product because the manufacturer has. We put the freedom to end of life a product or piece of hardware in the retailer's hands. So you know, sometimes these products are, are very durable and they'll last well beyond the manufacturer withdraws them from service. And I think that's one of the benefits of working with Main Street is that the retailer really has the freedom to determine the best technology for their stores. And if they need to go and invest in new technology, by helping them kind of keep the old running as long as they need it, that frees up the money for them to be able to invest in, in some new. So I think that's probably one of the big benefits of us. We also though, we know that there is a need for new technology in retail. And so we partner with some of the real leaders in our industry and that's people like Zebra Technologies when it comes to the mobility with HP, when it comes to point of sale and computers and displays and with Epson when it comes to printers. So we're very, very open to partnering with companies that are really kind of like-minded like we are that really puts the retailer first. And it certainly sounds like, you know, Main Street is not only kind of pulling all these technologies together to provide kind of a comprehensive solution for your customers, but also kind of helping them across that, the entirety of that life cycle um, yes. from beginning to end. Most definitely. We saw one, I'd say one really big example of, of where we really got involved. And this goes back to the, you know, having that experience in retail and knowing what works and what doesn't. And there was probably a trend maybe about five years ago with mobility where the retailers looked at, let's put a consumer grade device in our stores. That's the quickest way for us to get to mobility. You know, the, the associates are familiar with these devices. Um, that'll be the quickest path for us to get to mobility. And I know we kind of shook our heads at that because we know that retail, even the cleanest retail environment is still much harsher than your home or an office. 
And so that leads to a lot of failures. If, if a retailer has a, a device in their stores that isn't functioning, then that not only impacts customer service, it impacts uptime. It's a lot more money for them to maintain it. They need to invest in spares. And so with our clients, we try to get them to kind of look at a ruggedized mobility solution like Zebra. And I think more and more of them are embracing it because having consumer grade devices installed in the stores for a while, they're seeing the really high failure rate and the high cost. And they're looking at more of an upfront investment in something that's rugged that'll last them for a really long time. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And certainly, as you probably know, it's, it seems to be a recurring theme on, on the show, right? Which is sometimes there's a disconnect when we're designing things, we kind of have this designing from a boardroom. And then we, we look at the practicality of getting technology out into a frontline environment down mm -hmm. to the frontline workers you recognize that their needs, their requirements are vastly different than perhaps what we initially thought they might be. That's exactly right. And one of the benefits that we have as well is in doing the hardware and maintenance programs for the retailers, we see the devices come back from the stores. So we have a point of view or an advantage <laughs> that a retailer in a head office doesn't see. And that's why oftentimes we'll do the the troubleshooting and the analysis and try and if we're, we're starting to see some trends, try and report those back to the client and say, this is what we think is going on at store level. You may want to look at, you know, how you're either troubleshooting on the help desk or is there some kind of, we actually encountered one where operations implemented a change of process, which actually involved powering down registers overnight but then that impacted the ability of the scanners mm. to function untethered during the day. So it looked like we were having battery issues when in fact it was just an operational change that needed to be made. So being on the back end of the equipment coming back from the stores is a great benefit for us and for our clients too. Yeah, it's like a little bit of forensic science that you guys yeah. are doing to kind of figure out what's going on. Truly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so talk about your role, uh, you know, VP of sales enablement. What does that mean? What's your, and we'll talk about your, well, let's talk about your day job, which is VP of sales enablement. And we'll yeah. talk about your weekend hobby. So what is VP of sales enablement? What do you do at main street? So I really think that VP of sales enablement is really just a, a very lofty title for whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so I've been kind of one of the founding uh, members of this company. And um, I very much believe in what we do. I think we add a great value for, for retailers. So I'm kind of the, the person who's kind of front with my team, helping you know identify retailers that could benefit from our solutions, helping to craft the solutions, the partners that we need to engage on, and, and really trying to put together a solution that's relevant for the retailer. Um, that will help them save money. So we're, we're not here to, you know, sell them the latest and greatest printer for their back office if they don't need it. So really try and assess that kind of ecosystem. And um, also trying to make things as easy as possible for the retailer to work with us. So um, whether it's having visibility into the equipment that we support for them, the equipment that we store for them in our warehouse, um, the asset or the inventory management. So I, I'm probably one of the biggest client advocates within my business. And, you know, I, I know you, you do an awful lot of thought leadership um, mm -hmm. work yourself. So you, you've, you do a lot of blogging and, and videos and, and, and things. So, so talk about that, your kind of advocacy, if you will, uh, sure. in the broader market. So because I'm so passionate about the industry, about uh, maybe seven years ago, when we were launching a new kind of marketing campaign, it was suggested that I write a blog because I know so much about retail and I'm always wanting to learn and to study. And so we've been writing like a monthly blog for the last several years and focus on what's going on in the industry. Um, I do usually a lot of research around it on um, trying to provide that kind of unbiased voice um, and thought leadership. So, you know, in as much as we have these great partnerships with people like Zebra and HP and Epson, we still want to try and provide 
more of a, an unbiased voice and, and some value back for the people that, that are following us. And the blog is a great passion. Um, I'm starting to kind of pepper it these days with things in restaurant as well, because since the pandemic, mm. restaurant too has been investing a great deal in technology. And so they're also an industry to watch as well. And it's a logical extension for us because of the technology kind of overlay between retail and restaurant. Yeah, um, it's a very good point. Then retail, I mean, restaurants and, and hospitality facing many of the same challenges that, that mm -hmm. retail is right now. So let's talk about, about your moonlighting uh, job, <laughs> uh, your Sunday job. Um, tell, tell me about that. I mean, the, the how and, and why of it. So retail has been in my life since the time I was five years old and my mother went to work in a store. And I thought it was the most glamorous job on the planet. And I've never really lost the passion for it. Uh, when I was in high school, I worked in that same store, uh, then went to work at the head office of that company. And then I've been wanting to get back into a store for a really, really long time, because that's really the pulse of retail anyways. You know, you can sell to a head office, you can sell to a regional office, but it's really that kind of interaction in a store that I, I truly, truly love, because that's, that's what we're all here for anyways. We're here to support those efforts. And so over two years ago, there was an opportunity at my local grocery store, which is my favorite store because it's a foodie store. And um, I got a part-time job there and I absolutely love it. I think it's probably what kept me sane during the pandemic. Believe it or not, it got me out of the house. Um, I love the interaction that I have in the store. And the reason is, so nine to five, Monday to Friday, I have a completely different interaction than I have on a Sunday. And it's just dealing directly with a customer, um, helping them with whatever they need. I mean, we cover the whole store. I mean, it's a 75,000 square foot grocery store and we're here to help wherever we can. So I've, I sell groceries for some reason. I love begging and selling groceries. I've sanitized carts. I've been a greeter at the front asking people to wear masks. I've worked in the meat department, I worked in curbside. It's just wherever they need me. I just, I love being part of it. Well, that's great. I mean, it certainly sounds like it is, um, you know, kind of a, uh, a release for you, a, a great mm -hmm. opportunity to do something when you love. It you is. mentioned, you mentioned you're a foodie. Yeah. Uh, so do you have some ancillary benefits from working there? You get to see the greatest, latest, greatest uh, ingredients coming through. Um, yes. And it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, because I end up by spending a great deal of my paycheck every Sunday before I leave, but we do get to sample a lot of the food. And, you know, you can't sell something if you don't know it. And yeah. if you can't say this is something that is really, really good. And so some of the sauces that I get, like for some reason, I have a, a fridge full of jars of like condiments and sauces and, and all these great things. And um, it's wonderful to work in a store where my team and all the customers share that passion for food. Yeah. And do, do you enjoy cooking as well? Besides just, just, just eating food. I imagine you enjoy cooking as well. I do very much. Yeah. It's, um, it's only my husband and I, so I try not to cook too, too much, um, because otherwise we're going to have leftovers, but I spent the whole holidays cooking like crazy. And I really like French and Italian and, and Mediterranean, but I want to try and branch out as well. Yeah, I know the feeling. I, I really enjoy cooking myself. And I find that's the biggest challenge is when you, you enjoy cooking, you want to cook, and then you want to have a lot of food, more food than you, you possibly need. So that's you know, exactly I right. cooking and giving it to other people or inviting them over, which is also a, a great thing to do. Um, it is. So Debbie, so, you know, um, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's very clear your kind of passion comes out about this. And, and I think you have this very unique perspective because you're kind of dealing with customers at the, you know, the, the business level, if you will. And then, you know, you're in, in your, you know, moonlighting time, you are a frontline employee. You're working alongside mm -hmm. other frontline employees. So, so I'd love to dive into a couple of things. One is the, the big company. Um, perspective. So, you know, how are retailers, for example, 
dealing with these mm-hmm. challenges that they're facing on the front lines, the ones you kind of outlined? What are, what are they doing about it? I think what we've seen, so in the early days of the pandemic, it was, you know, plexiglass shields and masks. And then they realized that they needed to adapt their business very, very quickly. And it was technology that helped them do that. So I think one of the benefits of the pandemic, and it's not like there's a lot, but you know, there were different technologies that retailers were looking at implementing for a while before the pandemic, but there, I guess maybe there wasn't a compelling reason or a business case. With the pandemic, they realized that they needed to embrace more mobility, put more technology, more brain power, more capabilities in the hands of their associates. And so we saw a lot of investments in mobility, which they very much needed to drive things like curbside. Um, I think that was probably one of the big benefits that we saw and what the retailers did was invest in mobility. What I kind of think we're starting to see now though, is maybe those mobility investments were not made with a long-term thinking. So, you know, it was more, we've got to get this up and running today. We've got to get through this because otherwise they're going to shop somewhere else. And so now I think what we're starting to see is the retailer saying, okay, now I have this ecosystem of what I had before, what I invested in during COVID, how can I put this together in terms of a long-term strategy? So I think there are great opportunities there to kind of help the retailers figure out, you know, what what that ultimate ecosystem is going to look like, because the pandemic really has changed how we're going to shop. We are not going to go back to the way that we shopped in, say, February 2020. Curbside and pickup and home delivery has proven to be a great convenience for many of us, and and it's not going away. Yeah, I mean, I almost think, you know, there's examples, and as a consumer, I can probably think of ones which are you know, why weren't companies doing this all along, right? Retailers, mm-hmm. big and small. And it's not just the big ones. There's, there's a lot of small retailers who've had to, have had to adopt to, to, to exist. I remember being down on, on Cape Cod this summer and mm-hmm. there's this wonderful, I love Cape Cod. Yeah, there's this wonderful uh, coffee shop um, that uh, has these great muffins and, and great iced coffee. They actually make the ice cubes out of iced coffee, which is just fantastic. <sighs> So when the ice melts, it's just more coffee. So, um, Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's always, you know, traditionally as this line out the door was crazy. And obviously, you know, during COVID times, they, they couldn't do that. So they put in their own, you know, remote ordering system they had. And I was like, well, this is something that they probably should have done. And that went probably for the retailers all across the, all all across the Cape, right. Which was a traditional walk up and Mm -hmm. wait and all that. And everybody kind of had to adapt. Um, so in some ways, it's been a positive impetus of change, you know, given all the negativity that surrounded that caused it, but has kind of caused mm-hmm. them to change. But I think you probably hit a very good point, which is a lot of it seems like a Band-Aid approach, you know, to probably for the larger retailers. You know, a lot of this has been, you know, h- how quickly can we move? How quickly can we adapt? But there's, you know, a lot more that we need to kind of think about as we we move forward. Where do you think you know, companies are now along that journey? Are they still in the Band-Aid mode or are they beginning to kind of now shift? I think they're starting to shift now. Um, I think probably over the last maybe nine months or so, now that we're past the early days and and it's like, okay, this thing is not going away and, and truly customers' shopping behaviors have changed. And I think that was another thing that kind of, accelerated the implementation of of those technologies is the retailers needed to meet their customers where they wanted to be, where they wanted to shop. And I think retail has proven an amazing resiliency, certainly more than we would have thought they were able to even three years ago. And some of the other things that they have done that shows that kind of resiliency and that adaptability. So their business model changed overnight. It had to. But some of the things that they've done is curbside, we know for sure. I mean, that's front and center with all of them. But some of them have even taken old stores that they would have closed and instead made them dark stores or micro fulfillment centers. And what that gives them is they can actually have a store that could service a bunch of stores. And it's basically 
typically not a store that's open to the general public. Instead, it's going to be a highly optimized store that is going to be just for fulfilling online orders. And it works better for the employees because, or the frontline workers, because they can actually do their job quicker. They don't have to try and go and pick groceries around customers. It's better for the shoppers because they don't have these big unwieldy carts for curbside orders that they've got to try and navigate their own shopping carts. So I think that's another thing that retailers have done and are continuing to do that makes a lot of sense. And again, really demonstrates that resiliency. Yeah, it's a very similar thing that's happening in in restaurants as well with with the kitchens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely right. As well. So it's it's really interesting those parallels which you you mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I I I, I want to go back to that anecdote a little bit. You talked about um, near the beginning when you talked about you know the example of hey you know one of our customers really thought they could kind of you know give. Um, their, you know, uh, frontline retail employees, you know, consumer-based devices, we kind of recognize some of the challenge, inherent challenges with that. And, and then you've also talked about the fact that, hey, one of the things that retailers have done most recently during the pandemic is realized, let's, let's empower our employees with technology. I want to kind of flip mm-hmm. this back now to the frontline worker perspective on this, yeah. right? Which is, you know, how do they feel about that? How do they feel about more technology is there a an inherent kind of conflict there that's happening? Is there pushback? Is there receptivity toward that? Is it mixed? What are you kind of seeing that's happening uh, among the frontline workers themselves? Because I imagine one of the other things on top of everything is like, I've got all this stuff that I need to do. And now you're introducing new technology, which could be really good or it could be really disastrous for them, depending on how it's implemented. I think that's a really, really good point. You know, they, they are so focused on doing their job. It's like, don't add more technology for me to learn. Ultimately though, that technology helps them do their job and helps them be more successful. So I think it's really dependent on the retailer to educate those frontline workers about the technology and the benefits. One of the things I think that happens at store level is inconsistency. So you have a head office who is saying to my stores, I want you to roll this technology out. I want you to train your staff. But is that message consistent? Is the training consistent? Is the accessibility consistent? And so that's why I think really embracing more on the training and the learning side of things will help retailers better embrace or better promote uh, technology to the frontline workers. Yeah. I and mean, if it's you one... think about it, a frontline, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, keep going, please. Well, I was just going to say, if you think about a frontline retail worker, I can tell you in my store that we have um, people who are working there that are going to high school. And so, you know, they are probably much more proficient in technology than some of the older people in my store that are in their 70s. So you see this really big span of ages in in my store in particular, and I'm sure probably a lot of other ones, but you see different capability sets too. And so take some of the fear factor away from it um, and really try and advocate what that technology can do for the the frontline worker. Yeah, I think it's interesting, even when you talk about demographics, different age demographics in particular, like you said, I mean, you may have people who've been working in retail environments, maybe even the same store for decades, right? And yeah. saying this is a new way to work. And maybe I'm not comfortable with a changing the way I've worked, but also even using technology. And then on the flip side, like you said, you may have younger employees coming in high school kids who are very adept at technology. But you know, they're, they're used to very different type of technology, right? You know, using, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so even that they may look at this and say, well, this isn't what I'm used to, right? I'm used to, you know, consumer yeah. apps and consumer devices, and it doesn't necessarily work the same way. So, you know, I, I like the point you made about that consistency in how we're kind of training people, you know, really understanding their differences and in, in the receptivity toward that, but communicating the why uh, and the yeah. how. I always kind of talk about it both from a communication and training standpoint. It can be like a game of telephone 
particularly when it comes yes. to frontline, right? Where you're starting, you know, the message is very clear at the home office or who's ever, you know, the mm -hmm. subject matter expert is who's kind of putting it together. But by the time it gets down to the front lines, it becomes completely diluted and completely changed. Um, and Absolutely. Even stores that are in the same market. Yeah. So, you know, you could have, I noticed, for example, my local pet store, there's one that's five minutes from my house. There's one that's 10 minutes from my house. The one that's five minutes from my house is better because the store manager is better. It's, it's a better um, customer experience. So you can have so much variety in even a short radius or small radius when it comes to stores. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And it's just that, you know, consistency, getting down to that level turnover is probably even exacerbating that more and more today. Right. Cause it's, you know, and I it's not even, right. not even a one and done thing. So it's not like, okay, we, we can communicate this once we can train once it's like, no, this has to, this is pretty much an ongoing thing. That's an excellent point. You know, retail always had high turnover and now it's even worse because you've got frontline workers, you've got people that, you know, a pandemic helped people kind of take a second look at how they are earning a living and their quality of life. And some of them have chosen not to stay in retail. So you're see in a in an environment that had a high turnover in the first place, it's accelerated it. So I think that's a really good point. So what are, you know, you've obviously worked with a a number of retail customers over the years when it comes to implementing um, technology. And, you know, the term digital transformation is now one that's, you know, fairly widely used. It's a, it's a buzz term that's out there, but, you know, transformation means change uh, and, mm -hmm. and change can be disruptive. What are you, what are the things that you have seen that have been effective when companies, when your customers are implementing these new technologies, right? What has led to kind of successful deployments? What are mm -hmm. the things that have led to problems? So I, I think it's, you know, the, the buy-in. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to be working in a head office and think that a piece of technology is definitely going to be something that you need for your store. But the environment between that office and store level is so different that you really need to have the buy-in of the people that work in the stores. So, you know, do you have like a user group, for example, that's representative of different functions within a few stores <clears throat> and, and really get their buy-in as to how to use the product, how to implement it, how to get staff to embrace it and, um, it, and also have a hand in the training and the ongoing usage of that technology, I think makes a big difference. So it's not just head office driven, it really needs to be more of a 360 kind of implementation, I think. And I think the ones that have not involved that have not been successful. So you could invest in thousands and thousands of Zebra, you know, handheld devices. If the store doesn't know how to use that effectively, then you're not getting your pay, the retailer's not getting their payback on it. And then you've got customers who are at store level who are now working with a frontline worker who doesn't know how to use a piece of technology that's delaying the service. When it comes to curbside, your margin for error is, is almost nil because you've got to be able to take your orders quickly. You've got to take your orders accurately. You've got to have them ready for the customer quickly. You've got to have minimal substitutes. That all is driven by technology. And if the, the frontline worker doesn't know how to use that technology, then the retailer is going to fail. And, uh, you know, the store across the street is going to offer curbside as well. Yeah. So, you know, I've, when you, do you do, do you help customers, your customers to kind of organize some of those user groups? Do you help them with that kind of insights from the, from the frontline level at the, at the store level? We don't, I wish we did. We, um, we are very much on the IT side of the retail business. So we're sharing with them kind of what we see again when equipment comes back and, and helping yep. kind of isolate problems there. 
But as we start to get more involved with mobility, so mobility is a growth area yep. for Main Street because it's a growth area for retail. And so it's made us kind of change our focus, if you will, and look beyond just IT. How do we help out the, um, the change management teams and, and looking at doing more, I guess, cross-functional within our clients? So for our business, it's been a great opportunity for us to start to look how to change how we're basically going to market. And we have a great partnership with Skillful, I think, that is opening the doors for us to help do that. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you obviously spend, you know, um, a lot of time, you know, ha having had the experience, direct experience in retail yourself, you know, one of the things we, you know, you kind of talked about the challenges, you know, kind of at the high level for the deskless workforce. If you were to ask your colleagues, for example, you know, what's their biggest pain point? Um, what would they say? I, I would say, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say in, in my store, it's been difficult customers. We're, we're very blessed to have some really, really great customers. And, and again, I love those interactions. I think some of our biggest challenges is out of stocks. Mm. So, you know, is an out of stock because the manufacturer is delaying? Is it because of distribution? Is it because maybe we don't have enough people to get product on the shelves because grocery is getting really busy again? Um, which is great to see. So I think, you know, the out of stocks and especially for us as foodies, we've got to try and recommend if we don't have this product, then what is a substitute? And the way that I look at it is I don't want to lose the sale. I don't want that customer to come into my store and look for a product. And if I don't have it for them to go across the street, there have been times that I've recommended that they do because we don't have anything that would be similar. But where possible, I want to make sure, like I said, that we keep the sale. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's also a perfect example of probably where technology can come into play, right? I mean, you talked about yes. just the ability to kind of, okay, what's what's an alternative for this? Do we have it in stock, right? Where that's in the store exactly is it? Right. And even in terms of those answering those questions of, of why are we out of stock, right? Is it, you know, is it because we have a supplier issue? Is it just you know, somewhere in, in the back room, it's not on the shelves right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because as you said, you know, you, you're dealing with those, those customers coming in wondering why. I mean, I had that same experience going into my local grocery store, I think last yeah. week. And I was like, where is all the meat? You know, where is it? I'm like, are we, I'm like, I didn't read anything about, you know, meat shortages recently. So is it just a, mm -hmm. a temporary issue of, of stocking the shelves? So it's, it's, it's really that, you know, how to answer those questions for those, those customers as well. And, and giving that information exactly. out to the frontline work. Yeah, I agree. So one of the things I meant to ask you when I was talking about your background a little bit, and I forgot, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you had this passion for retail. Um, you know, you said you experienced it at a very early age and you thought it was the greatest thing. How did you get into the technology side of retail? Um. Or, I would or say why technology, was, right? Versus kind of retail operations. I actually, my job before I got into technology was working for a company that sold shopping carts to retail. Okay. So I kind of went from low tech, no tech <laughs> um, to technology. And it was just, it was a fluke. I was in finance at that point in time. The job opening came up um, and I latched onto it. And that was early nineties and things were a lot different when it came to technology that the retailers were using then. And it's been such an awesome experience to see how much it's changed and it's accelerated so much since, you know, smartphones came out in 2007 and it's like every few years, things have accelerated even more than say the previous decade has. So, so much is, is happening with retail that makes so much sense. And, and like I said, I'm just amazed at the resiliency that retailers have had, especially over the last two years. Yeah. So one of the questions I like to ask, particularly for the folks who are in technology is, you know, m some of us in technology, if you've worked in it long enough, you have kind of a love hate relationship with it, maybe. Um, so what are the things you love 
about working in technology. Uh, and what are the things that might be a little frustrating about it? When it comes to what I love about working in technology, it's how you can continue to refine process, how you can make the business more efficient and how you that ultimately can help make the customer shopping experience better. Because I know for our customers, if they've got that right, then their business will grow. People will keep coming back to them. Where I think it gets frustrating is, is when the retailers are not using the technology properly. And, you know, they'll, they'll fall to technology on when maybe it's, it hasn't been implemented properly. It's like, give it a chance. This, this will, this could make a lot of sense for your, for your business. Um, At the same time, we would certainly be very quick to see if, you know, if something isn't working for the retailer, then what do we need to do to try and get it to work? What can we do to, help them kind of better sell or advocate that technology to their, their store level people. Yeah. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation, Debbie. I mean, you know, I, it's, it's very rare that you have somebody who really, you know, everybody kind of says they have a passion for what they do and, and all that, but it's very clear. You, you have a passion, not only for kind of helping your, your customers, but this deep empathy um, for the frontline worker. And, and I, I really appreciate you joining us today. This has been a great discussion. Thank you. I've really, really enjoyed it. We're going to have to stay in touch about foodie stuff too. You know? Absolutely. No doubt about that. Um, well, now I know where I go get my tips because you're the one who's exactly. you're, you're getting them before I am. So uh, yep. I want to tell folks who are listening where they can learn more and, and find you if they want to connect. Assuming LinkedIn is a great place. Debbie Samurda on LinkedIn is probably uh, the best way to reach out to you directly, I assume. Yes, it is. And um, they can find your um, it, more information from Main Street uh, at the company website, which is www.mainstreetinc.net, correct? And um, I know you've got a lot of great stuff on the blog on, on the website. So I encourage folks to check that out. You also have a, a Twitter. Uh, you do a lot of on a content on Twitter um, and that's at POS at main street. So it's POS at main street is the Twitter handle. Um, and the same thing on Facebook, I believe. Correct. That's right. Yeah. That's awesome. So people definitely uh, check out more of the stuff that uh, Debbie is, is putting out there. Um, she's got some great thoughts, uh, particularly in retail and now in, in the, uh, in the restaurant space as well. Debbie, um, thanks again. And, uh, really look forward to keeping in touch. Me too. Thank you so much. It's been a great opportunity and I really, really do enjoy the podcast. So it's wonderful to be part of it. Excellent. And if you found this conversation as enjoyable as I have, um, please share and rate the podcast five-star ratings, help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. Uh, and a friendly reminder that this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. You can visit the Skillful website at skyllful.com. And if you or someone you know is out there innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn and share your story. Until then, see you on our next episode.